This is a thermoelectric cloud chamber, and in this video I'm going to explain what radiation is, why it's important that we study it, what we can see using this device, and the underlying principles of how it works. So let's do some physics. Radiation is everywhere. It's in the food that we eat, it's in the air that we breathe, it's continuously seeping out of the ground. And even us as carbon-based life forms, we are radioactive due to our carbon-14 content. Now we are able to survive, if not thrive, with these low levels of radiation. But when radioactivity and radioactive materials were first discovered by Becquerel and the Curies, it was found that it was very effective in the treatment of cancer and specifically targeting cancerous cells. Radium was quickly hailed a wonder material and industry took hold and shoved it in everything from creams to toothpaste to lipsticks to even food and drink. And this is where we start to see the effects of radiation poisoning and we realise that these materials also carry a significant hazard. So this is why it's really important that we have an understanding of radioactivity and how it affects living organisms so that we can protect ourselves. And further, how we can exploit radioactive materials for the effective treatment of diseases and of huge environmental concern, how we can use it as an alternative green energy source. So what is this and why is it important? Well, this is a cloud chamber and its purpose is to let us see radioactive particles. Now, the cloud chamber is a brilliant example of a British invention. It was designed by a Scotsman called Charles Wilson in 1911 and it came out of the Cavendish labs at the University of Cambridge. Now, Wilson's original design was the first ever radiation detector. And since then, cloud chambers have played a pivotal role in particle physics. They've led to the discovery of the positron and the muon, and ultimately landed Wilson a Nobel Prize for his invention. This cloud chamber is slightly different from Wilson's design. So Wilson used an expansion method, whereas this uses diffusion. But the principle remains exactly the same. We want to create an environment that enables cloud formation. So the first step is that we need a really cold surface. And for that, we use a Peltier device. So that is a semiconductor type material that when you pass a voltage through it, you make one side really hot and the other side really cold. Now that is some really cool physics that's known as the Seebeck effect. And what we've done with that is we've put the cold side upwards. So the plate that you can see that the rod's sitting on will have a nice cold patch on it. And that is where you're going to see the cloud formation. The next condition that we need is something called a supersaturated vapour, and we can get that through the use of alcohol, specifically isopropyl alcohol or propantool. And we would get the alcohol and squeezy pipette it onto the blue felt bed that you can see hiding inside the chamber lid. And that alcohol is very volatile, so what that means is that it wants to readily evaporate from being in liquid state to the vapour state, and it can do that change easily at room temperature. As the alcohol evaporates, it will diffuse through the chamber and this volume of air here will become saturated. So what that means is that that air is holding as much vapour as it possibly can at that temperature and at that volume. Now this is where the cold plate comes in. So as the vapour falls, it cools rapidly and this change in temperature pushes that vapour into a super saturated state. So what that means is that the air is essentially holding too much vapour now for that temperature and it's absolutely desperate to condense, it just needs something to condense onto. The stimulus for condensation comes from the radioactive source and the particles that it spits out, so let's take a closer look at that. The radioactive source that ships with the cloud chamber is a 2% thoriated tungsten welding rod, so it looks like this, and it contains 2% thorium, which is why it's radioactive. Now this is a really nice low activity, below background source that doesn't require any special handling and no special storage. So thorium is an alpha emitter, and what that means is that it spits out alpha particles, and it does that because it's more energetically favourable for thorium to exist as the daughter nuclei plus the alpha particle, rather than all together. Now the important thing to remember is that alpha particles are ionising. So as they are ejected and they travel through air molecules, they are going to strip electrons off of those air molecules, leaving behind positively charged ions. Now those ions are going to act as the condensation nuclei for condensation to take place and what we end up seeing is tiny clouds that trace out the paths of radioactive particles in the cloud chamber. Now when we look at the tracks that come off the thoriated tungsten welding rod, not only do we see alpha particles, we can also see beta particles and these come from the daughter nuclei of the thorium when it decays into radium. Beta particles are also ionising which is why we can see them and we can tell the difference between alpha and beta by observing the differences in the tracks that they make. 
So alpha particles typically leave behind short, straight and fat tracks. So they're short because the range of alpha particles in air is typically of the order of a few centimetres. They are straight because alpha particles are relatively big. They are a helium nucleus, so two protons and two neutrons. So when they punch through the air, they're very difficult to deflect. Um, and they are thick because they are relatively highly ionizing. They've got positive two charge from those two protons. So the chances of ionizing an air molecule when it comes into contact with it is quite high. So that's why the tracks are dense. On the other hand, we've got beta particles and these leave behind long, wiggly, faint tracks. So they're long because the range of beta particles in air can be tens of centimeters. They are wiggly because a beta particle is an electron, so it's much more easily deflected as it makes its flight through the air. And they are faint because they have less ionization power than an alpha particle because they've only got minus one charge. On top of visualising alpha and beta tracks in the chamber, there are a couple of different experiments that you can do. So you can try putting different sources in there and having a look at what decay modes those sources have got and eyeballing relative activities. You can also try wrapping the welding rod source in different materials and looking at the penetration power of both alpha and beta radiation. So for example, you might find a material that can stop alpha but let beta through. And there's also something really cool that you can do with a balloon, which lets you sample the radioactive dust in your environment. Now that one's really cool and I recommend that you watch our video on that, which you can find just here. Thank you very much for watching.